is a topic that's sort of been on my mind a lot uh, the last couple of years. Done a lot of thinking. Um, this talk sort of encompasses a lot of that thinking. Um, so where I want to start is kind of with the current state of web development, how we build things today. Um, I want to describe briefly sort of where I think it's lacking. Um, then I'm going to show an alternate way of building these sort of modern, real-time, auto-updating um, applications um, in a completely di different and new way than you're probably used to. I think you're going to like it. Um, so this talk is sort of premised on this idea that the web should not be single-paged. Um, so as Tim Berners-Lee sort of originally defined the web, it was a collection of these hyperlinked documents. Um, so by its very nature, the web's not a single-paged thing. Um, and so in today's environment, we sort of build all kinds of different things for the web. Um, we build applications that happen to be delivered through the browser. And then we build some more traditional content-focused websites. And we, all call, we call this all the web. Um, the second real point that I'm trying to make is I think we need a better way to build the web. So to sort of make this distinction a little bit more clear, this is Slack. Um, how many people here use Slack? Yes, I use Slack every day. I love Slack. Um, Slack isn't really what I'd call the web, though. So by my definition, Slack is an application. It's built using web technologies. It's delivered over the internet through a web browser. But it isn't really the web. Um, Slack doesn't work without JavaScript. That's great. That's fine. Um, it's implemented as a single page app. And I think that you could make the argument that that's the best way to build Slack. Slack is not a content delivery platform or tool. Slack exists so that I can collaborate really effectively and quickly with my coworkers. Um, it's a collaboration tool, not a content delivery platform. On the other hand, we have um, something like the New York Times. This is just an example. And I think we'd all agree the New York Times is not a web app. It's, it's a website. Um, the New York Times is itself sort of this collection of hyperlinked documents. They link to one another. Um, these documents link out to other aspects of the web, and other parts of the web link back to it. Um, fortunately, um, the New York Times isn't implemented as a single page web app. It's more traditional server rendered. Um, the New York Times works without JavaScript. And, well, for the most part, nothing's perfect, right? In fact, if you turn off any layer of enhancement on the New York Times, you still get access to your content. So you turn off JavaScript, as a user, I can still read an article. If you turn off CSS, I, as a user, can still read the article. It's not as, it doesn't look as nice, maybe, but I can still get access to the content that I'm after. If you turn off images, same story. Via the alt tag, I can understand sort of the context behind these images. So that sort of points to what this um, part of the web really prioritizes. Because con they put content first, because that's the thing that's accessible no matter what I as the user do. So I would say content is of ultimate concern here. So we have these sort of two very different types of applications. We have um, Applications like Slack that prioritize something other than content, and in Slack's case, they prioritize collaboration over content. Then we have more traditional websites like the New York Times, and they put content front and center. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, I'd like to stop sort of conflating these two very different things. They both are valid, they're both great, they serve very different purposes and have very different goals. So the last few years of web development, um, specifically two or three years, I've really been focused on better ways of building better slacks, right? better single page applications. Um, Ember comes to mind as, as a great way of doing that. Um, so we've seen a lot of good progress. But I would argue not everything really fits within that model. Not everything should be implemented a single page. It wouldn't make sense, I, I don't think, to build the New York Times as a single page web app. So what is someone like the New York Times to do? if they want to add some more modern, real-time features into their website um, without going completely single page. So in exploring this question, I built a little demo. And it'll start running behind you. So you'll see these two counters, one blue, one gray. Um, they'll start incrementing. 
And the blue counter represents the number of current users on this website. The gray one indicates the number of total views. Then we have a comment system as well. Did you so, I'm sorry? Did you zoom in? Um, no, I can't really. I apologize. Um, so as you can kind of see, we've got a lot of users that are starting to enter this bit of content. We'll start seeing the, the counter go back down. And this is, you know, it's a pretty real-time feeling application. As a user, I don't have to reload the page um, to get new state. It all sort of appears right in front of me. Um, and you noticed as comments were added, the counters kept counting. So there's no page refresh going on for any aspect of this. So let's just say hypothetically, the New York Times wanted to build something like this into their articles. They had some internal um, argument that adding real-time counters and comments that felt more like a chat would increase reader engagement or something like that. Um, what would they do now without going single page? So predictably, they could do this sort of hybridized client-server approach, right? So they want to make sure that the users have access to the content no matter what. So they might render the article on the server side. So as a user, I make a request to the article, server renders the, the content for the article, pushes it back down to the browser, and the counter and the comments might be implemented as client-side components. So when the page is rendered in my browser, those two components could boot up. Um, they could request the state from the backend application and then perform rendering locally. And then perhaps they would even open up a socket to the backend and um, state changes would be streamed down to the client and presented in real time. Um, and so this is completely valid. Now I want to point out though, it introduces some complexity within our program. So we have rendering logic not only on the server, we've moved part of it down to the client for these two real time components. And because we have rendering logic on both the server side and the client side, we also have to deal with state in two places. So we have state on our server, we have state on our, on our client. We actually have three problems now because sometimes the state doesn't match up. Um, and uh, no, one, no one here likes dealing with state. It's one of the hardest things to deal with. Um, so this sort of hybrid approach, it works. I wouldn't call it elegant. Um, I, I believe it adds a lot of complexity to our applications. And I think that really this is what drove the introduction of single page apps to begin with, right? It's difficult dealing with two sets of code, two code bases, um, two sets of business logic, two sets of state. So let's just move everything to a client. Great, solves a lot of problems for the kinds of apps that fit within that, that scheme. Um, the second problem I like to describe is the spinning wheel problem. Um, so because we're not doing a full render on the server, when the page is loaded in the browser, we're waiting on, as a user, I'm waiting on the two client-side components to boot up, right? They don't have everything they need. They weren't rendered on the server, so they've got to request the JavaScript. Once they get the JavaScript, they boot up, they request the state from the server. They establish a socket with the server. They have to wait on all of these things. Um, if any of those things goes wrong, as a user, I see a spinning wheel. Um, and this happens all too often, especially in circumstances of flaky connections, things like that. Um, so this really kind of gets into the argument of progressive enhancement, right? And I'm not going to talk a lot about progressive enhancement. I don't want to start an argument about progressive enhancement. I really only make, make I only want to make one point, and that is, um, it's still necessary when content is prioritized above anything else. Slack should not care about progressive enhancement. It should not work without JavaScript whatsoever. New York Times needs to continue because they've really put the content first. Um, there's a lot of sort of debate and argument um, about this, and I think that a lot of it stems from sort of the old school web standards guys. That's more of my background. Um, building these content-driven applications and then we're building all kinds of new things on the web that don't prioritize content, shouldn't prioritize content. And so they're building these applications with totally different goals and totally different focuses 
One side says, we need progressive enhancement across all of these. The other one says, no, we don't. And they're both right for their specific use case. Um, so I think web standards will win on this um, for applications, websites that prioritize content first. Um, so sort of to combat this, both the first load problem um, to help um, quell some of the fears about progressive enhancement, there's this new thing that we've started doing called isomorphic JavaScript. And basically, for those who aren't aware, I'm sure most are, um, evaluate all of your code, do all the rendering on the back end for the initial request, push it down to the server, to the client rather, where it's all rendered at once, and then your client side components would take over and update the new state. Um, I tweeted this out a few weeks ago about isomorphic JavaScript in real life. Um, this is sort of what it feels like to me. Um, and at least 51 people agree. Um, so I would sort of summarize my feelings on isomorphic JavaScript as it's not elegant, potentially dangerous, and it's the, really kind of the wrong tool for the job. So please don't. Please don't hurt yourself. Um, so what are we really left with here? Um, so I would say there's, there's two goals in what we want to build. We want to avoid the pitfalls of single page apps for our use case. And we want to avoid the, the pitfalls of uh, client-side components, this sort of hybrid client-server approach, where we have our state in multiple places and our rendering logic that deals with that state in multiple places. So sort of what we're left with is the only option is we're going to do a full server render. And then we're going to add real time as a layer. So every aspect of the page, including the dynamic aspects, would be rendered on the initial request, pushed back in the response to the browser, where it's rendered. And then the whole page boots up and establishes sort of this real-time layer. Um, I would say it's real-time as progressive enhancement because if anything fails, um, fails to work, such as a WebSocket connection can't be established or something of that nature, um, as a user, I still have access to my content. Um, it's just, in our case, I don't see these auto-updating counters or maybe my comments don't show up immediately without a page refresh and those sorts of things but I can still access the content, which is the thing that I'm concerned about as a user. The second thing um, here is that it allows us to keep the business logic on the server side, um, right now JavaScript, um, and there was much rejoicing. Um, I love JavaScript, it's one of the first languages I learned, um, but I don't like having to write it for my applications. The less code that I have to write, the better in my opinion. Um, Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, so I want to show an example now. Um, and I don't want anyone here to think I'm completely trolling you. Um, this isn't all high-level conceptual things. Um, the video that you saw earlier was of a real application running on a real production server. It actually works. Um, everything that powers this, this sort of new approach is open source. It's MIT licensed. It's on GitHub today. Um, there's a link to the example talk at the end of the talk, or the example app at the end of the talk. Um, you can pull it down, you can use it, you can sell it if you wanted to. Um, so nothing hypothetical. So we're gonna start kind of in a weird place with this, this example. Um, at least it might feel a little weird. So we're gonna start on the, the view template side, which isn't really the first thing we start thinking about as app developers necessarily. But really, this is where it all starts. So here's the source code for the content statistics part of our example. Um, I want to kind of isolate this by itself, and we'll, we'll talk about this, and we'll talk about comments later. So you'll notice these three weird data dash star attributes. And what these do is they, they notate or mark the nodes that represent the underlying state of our program. Sort of kind of think of it like a state notation. So this first one, um, data scope, uh, s describes this node as representing an object of our program. Um, here it represents the, the content statistics in our program. <laughs> the next node nested under the scope is a prop which represents a type of our statistics. Um, here this node represents active. Um, and then of course the same thing for total. So in this system, this is all the view template is. Um, there's nothing more to it. 
Notice there's complete absence of view logic, which begs the question, how in the world do you render this thing? And it's a good question. I hope, hope hopefully have a good answer. Um, rendering is, is a completely external action that's performed on, on top of this view, rather than the logic being mixed in and sort of compiled. So for example, say we wanted to render this data. So this is a hash. It has two keys, active and total, and two values, 3 and 42. And we want to kind of map these in. Um, so I kind of broke the data out so that it would, it would um, match with the structure of the view a bit more. And you can kind of see reason about how we might do this. We could match the active key to the active prop and the total key to the total prop and just insert the values. And you'd be correct. There's some logic, this is written in Ruby, um, that does just that. So let's step through it. Um, the first bit of our logic is view, which is obvious, right? We want to address our view, which in this case is, um, is our content statistics. Um, the second bit of our logic, we're, we're sort of reducing our scope. We, we say this is the scope that we're concerned about in our template for our statistics, because that's the data that we're rendering. And then finally, we call apply with our data. So apply, I won't go into all the specifics about how it works, but you can think of it as it, make, it makes your view template match your data structure, and then it maps the values in. So here, there, you know, the data already matches our view structure, so it's simply a matter of, of mapping the values. So we can see after apply is called, um, the active and total values from our data are represented accurately in our view. So this is called non-destructive rendering. Um, it's non-destructive because after rendering, we still know what the underlying intent of our view is, of our rendered view. After rendering, we still know which node represents the statistics. We know which node represents the property of our statistics, the active and total. And this separation between the structure of our template and the logic of rendering is extremely important. We need to preserve this. So we'll see why that's so important here in just a few minutes when we get into the real-time aspect. Before we talk about real-time, though, I want to show this in context. Um, so in this bit of code, there's three concepts represented. There's routing, rendering, and data access. So routing is sort of the, the, the first high-level thing. So what this bit of code, again, this is all written in Ruby. Um, what this code is saying is, for get requests to the root URL, we want to execute everything between the do and the end. Um, so when a request comes in, a get request to the root URL, the first bit of code that we're going to execute is sort of familiar to us, right? Um, we're saying view.scope stats. So we're addressing our view, we're reducing scope to stats. And we call render. Um, so when we call our display render, or di render display, it's actually invoking um, something called a, a renderer, right? So you can think of a renderer as an abstraction of our view logic. So what we had before, view.apply with our data set, um, that's abstracted away into this thing called a display renderer. So in our route, we simply say what should happen. We don't describe anything about how it happens. That's abstracted away. So we invoke our display renderer with a data set. Um, we want our statistic data, and we want all of it. So again, this, uh, this is an abstraction. So we've abstracted away all of the data access um, into this data access layer that we can simply say what data set that we want um, to render instead of describing how we go about getting it. Behind the scenes in this example, it's actually using Redis as a data store. It doesn't matter. And then finally, we call subscribe. What subscribe does is it says, I, as the developer, am interested in this rendered view um, staying up to date with any changes in state that occur on the back end that would affect its rendering. Okay, so um, this basically is saying subscribe the view to any changes that occur so that it stays in state. So what this looks like now, once our statistics are rendered, um, a generic JavaScript library takes over, establishes a WebSocket connection with the server, and so now both, of, both our server and our client are sort of in a waiting state. So um, our client's waiting on instructions from the server, new state. Our server's waiting on the state to change so that it can tell the client, hey, you need to update yourself. 
So eventually a state change comes in. Let's say somebody joins. Um, the server is made aware of it, and the server goes through a re-rendering step. So what this re-render looks like is not actually rendering the HTML again. So what it's actually doing is building up a set of transformation instructions. These are generic instructions for uh, how to update a, a rendered view to match the new state. So those transformations are built up, pushed back down to the WebSocket to the JavaScript library, which applies those transformations to the view so that the view represent, represents accurately the new state of the application. That's an example of what an instruction would look like in our case. Um, serialized as JSON, simply saying apply this data, uh, which the JavaScript library would, would uh, perform those instructions on the view. So this is called the view transformation protocol. Um, the view transformation protocol is a way of representing view rendering as a set of data transformations. Um, what this allows us to do is to write our business logic once and evaluate it only on the server side. So our JavaScript library in this case sort of understands generally, speaks the same language as the server, right? It understands how views are rendered and how to update them, but it knows nothing specific about the business logic of our application about how these views are rendered. That's always evaluated on the server side, and which builds up these transformations which can be applied generically by our client library. Um, the view transformation protocol is faster because we only have to render the changes. So when this transformation is received, um, we can do a diff and we can say, these are the nodes that have changed. So we don't have to rip everything out and rebuild it from scratch. Um, the only time nodes are added is when new data is added that wasn't represented before. The only time they're destroyed is when data was rendered and now shouldn't be because it was deleted in the, in our, the state of our program. Um, there's no replacement of nodes. And View transformation protocol is really the, the real-time web expressed as progressive enhancement. So um, it allows all of our rendering to occur on the server, so we don't have the first request problem. Everything's rendered up front. And if for some reason we can't establish a WebSocket connection with the server, no big deal. Um, I, as a user, still have access to my content. Maybe it's just not as nice, but nothing really appears broken to me as a user. So, I want to move on to comments now. So as you saw before, as comments are created, the counters keep counting. So there's no page refresh going on. Um, so how do we do this without writing JavaScript? Um, so this introduces this concept called mutable. And mutable is uh, another aspect of the client library. What mutable is, is a JavaScript component that observes a user's interaction with a node and understands which interactions will cause a change in the underlying state of our application. So in this case, we describe our form, our comment form, as being a mutable object. And mutable is smart enough to know, all right, when that form is submitted, that's changing the state of our program. So as a user, I type my comment, I submit the form, and mutable takes over, hijacks the form submission, avoiding the full page refresh pushes that state transformation up the WebSocket to the server, triggering the rebuild of our transformations, which push back down um, to the client so that the comments render. And you'll notice it's like a nice circular pattern here. Um, so this is called simple state propagation. And simple state propagation really is just an easier way of dealing with um, UI interactions and state changes that originate from the client. Um, it's not really obvious in that diagram, but an important aspect of simple state propagation is that all changes in view state come from the server. So there's no local render step in the case of creating a comment. Something like Ember, say, um, how they might approach it is when the form submitted, they would change their local state, do a re-render locally so that it's represented immediately, then tell the server about it. And then once the server accepts that change in state, it tells all other clients, hey, this comment was created. So there's this little blip in time where my local state doesn't match the true state of the server. And um, that can cause problems in some situations, especially for these types of applications. Um, how many times have you 
you know, done something that renders immediately, you refresh the page, and it's, you know, it's not the same thing. It's not there. For some reason, the server didn't create it, or something happened. Um, this avoids that completely. So in simple state propagation, the server contains ultimate truth, always. Um, and the server is always responsible for instructing clients on how to perform new renders of new state. So that applies even to the originator of the state change. And what this allows us to do is prioritize user trust over performance. So for these types of applications, the non-slacks, um, where we really care that what the user sees is accurate, always. So there isn't a blip in time where local state doesn't match server state. Um, this, this provides for that. Um, it's not as performant. We have to wait on the server to accept the state change and tell us how to update the view. Um, but it guarantees that what the user sees is true at any given time. Um, so I said there was an open source project behind this, and there is. It's called Pacquiao. Um, it's been out for a couple of years. It's a web framework for Ruby. Um, it does everything that you saw today. The example app is built on top of this, this framework. Um, it's been out for a couple of years. There's a few dozen contributors. Um, and we just recently started making the real-time aspect of the framework available for use, which does all the auto-updating views from the server side. Um, we've been using it internally at my company for several months. Um, we're excited to finally push it out there for the world. Um, so take a look. Try it out. Maybe use it for your next project. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brian P. Again, please check out Pacquiao. I'd love your feedback. Um, Metabon is my company. Um, we build custom apps for lots of happy customers. And if you're interested in seeing the source for this talk, it's about 100 lines. I didn't, I didn't um, do an official count, but it's around 100 lines of code. You will see no JavaScript. Um, you can find it at GitHub, github.com slash Brian P slash real time dash talk. Um, I'd love to hear about your experience. Um, thanks.